Welcome back everyone. We're going to extend our knowledge of probability to probability distributions. Two in particular, discrete and continuous. Let's get on with this. Make sure I've got my pen going here. There we go. All right. Now to pick up the slideshow, or the slide rather, slides, in Blackboard, you can actually get this link in case you want to watch this good video that I found. So we're going to talk in this section, or this chapter, about probability distributions in general, and binomial distributions, and then a couple of other special ones. First of all, we have to clear out some things, and the first thing we're going to hit is discrete versus continuous. You can pause at any time, remember, and read the rest of it. We're going to get to all those. First of all, what's a random variable? It's a value that, that's associated with each outcome of a probability distribution. It's represented by x, should have a dot there at the end, right? For example, X could represent the number of sales calls that a salesperson makes in one day, like today, today or tomorrow. Or it could represent the hours spent on sales calls in one day. Lots of possibilities. Now, what are the discrete ones? Discrete random variables are ones that are finite or countable. If you can list them, even if the list doesn't come to an end, they're discrete. And we'll have some examples that set you straight. Here's an example right here. The number of sales calls that a salesperson makes in one day. We can count these. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and whatever. If you can count them, good. Notice you can't make 1.3 calls. So that's the difference, as you'll see. How about continuous ones then? Well, this one has an uncountable number, and it's represented by an interval on the number line. In other words, all those numbers in between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, and so on. Here's an example. Again, the sales calls, but this time it's hours spent on the sales calls. So we can have zero hours. We can have one, two, three, four, five, and so on. But it's not discrete because we can have 1.3 or, oops, 2.714 hours, and so on. Anything in between is fine. So it's a continuous random variable. Another example. Try this one for yourself. I would suggest you hit pause, try this out, see if you get it right. There's no harm in it, no one's gonna know except you. So X represents the number of Fortune 500 companies that lost money last year. And it's a discrete one, because you can count them. Maybe none, maybe there's one, two, three, maybe all 500 of them. But they are, they are countable. How about this one? Try this one. Remember, hit pause, give it a shot, because you'll learn from trying it. So X is going to represent the volume of gasoline in a 21-gallon tank. That's the gasoline that's in the tank right now. And that's a continuous one, because not only could we have zero gallons in a tank. We could have one, two, but it could be anything in between, too. We could be running on 3.145 gallons. Continuous. You can't count those gallons. You could count gallons, but you couldn't count how many gallons because you can have fractions. Now, each probability distribution, so now you know discrete items, discrete variables are countable ones. 
Now we're going to make it into a probability distribution. And that lists possible values along with their respective probabilities. And a, a chart will give you a real good idea of how this goes. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, the probability, each probability is somewhere between 0 and 1, inclusive. Could be 0, could be 1, could be anywhere in between. And second of all, when you count up all the probabilities that you do have, the sum has to be 1. This means take all each of the probabilities, add them up together, this means sum, and you should get it 1. In other words, 100%, same thing. Now let's let x be a discrete random variable and here are the possible outcomes. We've got n of them. We want to make a frequency distribution for those possible outcomes. Next, once we've got that, we're going to find the sum of the frequencies. And we'll find the probability for each of those outcomes. And all you need to do is divide the frequency by the sum of the frequencies. Make sure that every probability is between 0 and 1, and also that the sum of all those probabilities that you have in your list is 1. Here's an example for you to look at. We're talking about, well, hit pause and read through it, but I'm going to hit some of the high points. We've given this test, test to 150 employees. Each person was given a whole number score from 1 to 5. So are you a 3? Are you a 4? Are you a 4.2? 1 is extremely passive. That's a 1. 5 is extremely aggressive. Score of 3 means you're sort of in the middle. Here are the results on the right. We want a probability distribution for the random variable x. First of all, notice in the first column, you've got the possible outcomes. A person could get a 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And we've already listed the results. Remember, we had 150 employees. So when you add these up, this should give you 150. That's a start. And always one real good idea is draw some kind of a picture. In this case, case, what might be a good idea is make a histogram out of this. We've done that before in the last chapter. In fact, in chapter 2. Next, we want the frequency of each score divided by the total. That will give our relative frequency, which is also the probability. It's what before we described as a relative frequency. How many ones we can get, and what is our total? We had 150 people surveyed. So here is our discrete probability distribution. Here are the values here. And here are the probabilities in the second row. Now, check it out. Is it a valid probability distribution? Check first. Are all of these somewhere from 0 to 1? Sure enough, you can see right away, we've got 0 point for each one of them, so it's between 0 and 1, inclusive. Also, if you add these up, if you add all five of those, you end up with a one. Since it adds up to one, and each probability is between zero and one, we have ourselves a valid discrete probability distribution. Remember, it's discrete because we can add these things up. One, two, three, and so on. 
and here's our histogram. Good idea to make a histogram or some kind of picture with almost everything you do from here on. Here's a good histogram. Notice the, the picture that sort of draws. We'll get back to that. It's approximately symmetric. What does that mean? It means the right half and the left half are mirror images of each other or very close to it. Here's another one. Number two, let's say. Example number two. Here's our, here are our discrete possibilities. Days of rain. We can't half a day of rain. We're not going that way. Either it rains in a particular day or it doesn't. So it can be zero, one, two, three. We can count those. So it's discrete. The probabilities, 0 0.216, 0 0.432, 0 0.288, 0 0.064. Are all of those between 0 and 1? Sure it is. Now, do they add to give you 1? Grab your calculator, hit pause, check it out for yourself. It's a good practice. So it's a, it looks like it's a probability distribution. Each of these are between 0 and 1. And if you add those up, you get a 1. Since both conditions are met, it is a probability distribution, and in fact, a discrete probability distribution. How about this one? This is example number 3. Here are the possible outcomes. Here is the probability for each one of those outcomes. So the chance of getting a 5 is supposed to be 0.28, a little bit over 1 fourth or 28% if you like it that way. So, first of all, do these probabilities show up between 0 and 1? And second, what's the second condition? You have to be able to add them and end up with a 1. Well, it is, they are between 0 and 1, and we didn't quite make it on the probabilities. When you add these all up, you get 1.07. Not good. It should have turned out to be a 1 to be a probability distribution. So this one fails. Next, how about this one? A little bit of a different look. We don't have them in decimals. We have them in fractions, but hey, your calculator can take care of that, right? First of all, do each of those probabilities end up between 0 and 1? Uh-oh, we've got a problem here. This isn't between 0 and 1, and this one isn't either. And if you jumped ahead and checked to see whether those add to 1, you'll find, yes, it did. But it failed on this one. So it's not a probability distribution. You can never have a negative probability or something greater than 1 or less than 1, for that matter. Now, how about some things we've talked about in Chapter 2? We've got a distribution. What is the mean? This is the mean for the population. And this is how you find it. Now, if you're not careful, like your book wasn't, and this slide wasn't before I corrected it, what you have to do is take each possible outcome and multiply it times its probability. Get all of those products and add them together. Now, what am I talking about? Where did they make a mistake? Well, they made the mistake by originally writing it like this. Well, if you're not careful, you might add all the x's up and then multiply it times the probability. 
That's not the idea. This is how it works. You take each outcome, multiply it times its probability, add up all those products, and that is the mean of your discrete probability distribution. And actually using a table, it's pretty easy. In fact, not only using a table, the calculator makes quick work of it as well. So take each value of x, multiply it by the corresponding probability, and then add all those products. Here's a distribution for the personality inventory test. So here are the possible results. One, two, three, four, five. So you can see it's a discrete distribution. The probabilities are here in the second column. And our first job is to multiply each of those together to give us the first product. Take the second one, multiply it times its probability, and get the second product. Do that all the way through. And when you've got all these results, add them all together. Oops, a little sloppy, but you had it up there earlier anyway. The mean will be the sum of those products. In this case, 2.94. Now, I don't expect you to believe this. I would like it if you had stopped this right now even, because maybe the 2.94 isn't correct. Multiply in each of these rows. Do that multiplication, and this one, and this one, and that, and that one. And add those products. See if you get the 2.94 as the slide suggests. And a recap. To get the mean score, take each one of those products, the value times its probability, add up all those products, and there's our mean score. Remember, three means you're neither passive or aggressive. This means they're slightly passive, but not very much. In fact, I'm not sure that this really would be significantly different from a three. It's pretty close. But you know, we can do that in another chapter. Let's get back to that at a different time. Now we've talked about the mean. And this is how you find the mean. Add up all those products. And there you get the mean. Now, one of the other things we talked about in chapter two was how spread out is this distribution? Well, this is how you calculate the variance. And I'll give you a tip. Don't write it down in your notes. I'm going to tell you a much easier way of doing this. Now, we talked about variance. That is how the calculator is going to do it for you. Well, sort of. Here's how you get the standard deviation. If you had to do it by longhand, if all of a sudden you were transported back to 1950 and had to do all this by hand. Other, but we're not going to. We're going to use a calculator. And you actually have seen this before in your calculator. Remember when we got those five number summaries? Remember Q1, oops, Q1, the median, which is also Q2, Q3, along with the minimum value and the maximum value. Those were at the end of your list when you did one variable stats. And you got to that by hitting stat 
and calculate and entering the numbers that you need for one variable stats telling the calculator where can you find these numbers well before those results there are some other things in the list and you saw some of them x bar alias mu if you're talking about the population but there's several things up here and one of those is the standard deviation for a population s if it's for a sample this or this whichever one you're working with will give you exactly what you need you do not need to do this calculation by hand i'm never going to ask you to do that so your question is well, how about the variance you didn't say anything about that well the variance you can find by picking that out, squaring it, and you've got your variance. It's that simple. The variance is used so seldom that it actually isn't listed in the calculator when it does all those calculations. In fact, in doing those calculations, at some point it does get the variance before it takes the square root. However, it's not important enough to be shown in that big list of results from the calculations. Okay, let's take a look at this inventory test again. What is the variance and what is the standard deviation? Okay, now do not go back here and decide, oh, he lied to me. I'm going to have to do all that work. No. This is what you're going to do. You're going to take those numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In your calculator, you're going to go to Stat, Edit, and I would suggest that you put in List 1. That will be the scores or the X values. Second, you're going to take these probabilities. You're going to put the probabilities in list number two. Probability values. And then you're going to go to stat again. You're going to go to calculate again. And you're going to go to one variable stats again. You're going to tell it that the values are in L1. And one we didn't use much before, the frequency list, that you'll tell the calculator is in L2. Then you'll go down here to calculate. And that will give you the standard deviation. This or this, depending on whether it's a population variable or a st statistic from the sample and then to get the variance square whichever one you're working with and you'll get the variance this is what your calculator is doing for you do you care if you do my hat's off to you but you're never going to have to do that. But just appreciate the fact that your calculator is saving you from a lot of work. Remember, if it's the population, you're going to use this value. If it's from a sample, then you're going to use the S value. And they have to do with X, that's why the X is there. Now most of those values, if you look back at them, most of them aren't too far from 1.3. Or by more than 1.3, I'm sorry. So your mean was 2.94. If you picked something at random, take one value out of that list at random, the chances are that this random one you picked out of the list probably won't be any further than 1.3 
away from the 2.94 mean. That's what it means. Anything more than 1.3 away from the 2.94, and that gets a little bit unusual, maybe a little bit unusual, maybe very unusual, depending on the magnitude of that. Now, another thing we want to know about is an expected value. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And this means if you're doing something a lot of times, remember our law of large numbers? Well, this sort of fits in with that. If you did something a lot of times, what would your expected value be over the long haul? That means, what is the mean if you did it a lot of times? And the expected value is the same thing as the mean. Expected value and the mean, one and the same. Here's an example, because I'll, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. So we're going to talk about a raffle, just to make things simple. We've got 1,500 tickets. Imagine this is your organization. You're going to have a raffle. You're going to sell 1,500 tickets, no more, hopefully, and no less. You're going to sell each one for $2. Now, there are going to be four prizes. The top prize, and that person gets $500. The second prize gets $250, and it's still not too bad for the $2 entry. The third prize is still $150, and the, even the fourth prize, $75, not too bad. Each person buys one ticket. We want to find the expected value, and what does that mean? First of all, I'll make a list of what can happen. Here are the, th the things that can happen. First of all, right off the bat, you have to pay $2 for a ticket. If you don't pay the $2 for a ticket, you don't get a raffle ticket. If you win the big one, you get $500. But remember, you already paid the $2, so you only came out ahead by $495. If you get the second prize, you actually end up $248 to the good. Third prize, after the $2 is taken out, you've gained $148 for the day. And if you come in fourth, you still get $73 to take home. If you don't win a prize, though, you just lost two dollars. So this is the beginning. What are the possible outcomes? The outcomes are, quite often, you just lose two dollars. You had fun perhaps with it, but maybe you came ahead seventy-three dollars, or maybe you went home with one hundred forty-eight dollars, or two forty-eight or $498. Those are the outcomes. So, here's how you set it up. What are the outcomes, or the gain in this case? First prize, $498. What's the probability though? There's only one winning ticket out of the 1,500. And remember our basic probability? Winners over the total possibilities. For the second prize, it isn't much different except you get 248, and it's still only one ticket, so these probabilities are the same. For third prize, not much different, a little bit less in the earnings category, but the probability is still the same because there's one ticket that can win you that. Fourth prize, go home with $73, but you're only one of 1,500 people. So that's your probability. And we have a few people that lose, don't we? 
if we've got 1,500 tickets, 1,496 people didn't win. So that's the probability that those people lost $2 for the night. Now, how do we put that together? This is our expected value, and I'm going to fix this. Because remember, we have to do that multiplication before we start doing the addition. So here's the 498 times 1 over 1500. 248 times 1 over 1500. Next one here. The next one here. And the people who had fun but didn't win anything for the night. Make sure you do the, all the individual multiplications. Add those together. One, two, three, four, five numbers. And when you add those together, this is your expected value. This is the mean for all those people playing the raffle tonight. Now what does the negative $1.35 mean? It means that if you did this for years and years and years, once a day maybe, you would average losing $1.35 per day. Well that's it folks. That's expected value. And there you go. That's the result down there, which I just mentioned. I'm glad you came back, and I hope you understood what we did today. Any questions, either now or while you're doing the exercises, bring them into class. We'll talk them out, and we'll get you straight. Until next time, take care. Bye.